Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there, welcome to ATL on 29, a Peachtree Hoops podcast where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. Uh, the Hawks suffered their first loss of the season tonight to the Philadelphia 76ers. The Hawks lost when Vince Carter missed a three-point shot at the buzzer. Uh, when Lloyd Pierce was asked about the design for the last play, you know, he, he noted that the Hawks... He said he wanted to get a shot, which I think, you know, if you read between the lines, means that he wanted to get a three-point shot. He did not want this game to go to overtime uh, when the team has to get on a plane and travel to Miami to face another physical team tomorrow night. Uh, so I think the intent there was that the Hawks definitely wanted to get a three-point shot. At the same time, that may have not have been the one that they wanted to get. It was a little bit curious. Uh, I think it was DeAndre Bembry had the ball after it had been inbounded. Trey kind of sprinted over to him, and it seemed at that point a pretty easy play to just try a handoff there. Uh, it was nobody between him, and Dre was looking right at him, but uh, he kind of took it back, gave it to Vince. Vince dribbled up. He's kind of an off-balance, uh, falling to his right three that, you know, from that angle, we had a, our seats aren't necessarily the greatest seats, but we had a pretty good angle on that particular shot, and it was, it almost looked like it was going to go in, but it did not. And so the Hawks are now 2-1. and one. Trey Young was named Eastern Conference Player of the Week earlier in the day. He finished this one with 25 points and 9 assists, although he did have 7 turnovers. Uh, you know, he came into the game uh, after scoring 38 and 39 points in his first two games, so you might say that 25 is a bit of a you know a downturn but you know, you have to take two factors into consideration one the 76ers are a good defense which is completely underselling it they might be a great defense they might be one of the best defenses we've ever seen uh, it's kind of unfair that you can put Joel Embiid next to Al Horford next to Ben Simmons next to Matisse Tybel next to Josh Richardson uh, and I'm probably forgetting somebody that's how that's how deep the 76ers go on elite defenders. Am I missing somebody? Okay, I'm going to look here and make sure I'm not missing. No, that's, that's probably it. But yeah, five unfairly elite defenders on one team. That's, that's something that Trey's not going to see on a lot of nights. The other mitigating factor that you have to take into consideration when you consider Trey's game tonight is that, you know, in addition to the 76ers being an amazing defensive team, they were playing some obscenely tilted defenses against Trey, um, in addition to some blitzing. And I asked Lloyd Pierce about blitzing earlier this morning, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but they were trying full-court pressure. They were doing things with, like, two people in full-court pressure. So basically, Trey is getting the ball 90 feet from the basket, and the Sixers have two people there to just kind of make him just give up the ball right there. It's like, okay, you're here. We've got two defenders. We're willing to play four on three behind this just because we don't want you to have the ball. Uh, there was one where they did that. There was one play where they did that, and, you know, Trey threw a touchdown pass to Alex Len for a dunk. Uh, but, yeah, just some ridiculous ploys to get the ball out of Trey's hands. Let's go to an audio clip this morning of Coach Lloyd Pierce talking about what the Hawks will see this season in terms of blitzing defenses and what he wants to achieve against them. 
like I said in preseason, we knew teams were going to blitz them. Right. Uh, three to five teams in preseason did it. Not consistently, but enough. We saw that last year. We didn't handle it very well last year, although we handled it uh, pretty well. You know, we had two two of our turnovers in the fourth quarter were out of the blitz, but we also scored against the drive was because of the blitz. Uh, Dre gets to the free throw line. DeAndre Bimber gets to the free throw line because of the blitz. Dre missed the layup that was you know a great drive, but we're handling it well. We got to convert, but. You know, I don't think there's anything. They always have, there's always a team with a pesky guard, and these guys have two with Bible and Josh Richardson that'll come in and use their length and do it differently. They'll use their length to try and bother Trey, but everyone's trying to pick him up, pressure him, put him under duress. Um, but it's no different. He's just having success right now, and, and we are more prepared for the blitz. We have to be able to handle that more consistently than we're, we're doing. We just know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be that way all year. He doesn't need to have 39 or 38 for them to blitz. Uh, they're going to blitz because they don't want John to get rolled. And they're going to blitz because they don't want him to be a facilitator. They're going to blitz because they don't want him to shoot three. So we're going to see it in some form or fashion all year. What, what do you want from the other four players on the court when he does get blitzed? It's easy. Space. Space and be available. You know, someone needs to be available in front of the ball. Someone needs to be available behind the ball. Someone needs to be available right below him. So... You put two on the ball, we've got four on three behind it. And I can't tell you where or sh where it should go, uh, but once it goes out, we've got to attack four on three before they can get settled. And that's, and that's standard. That's nothing special that we're doing. That's just standard blitz reaction. People can do other things to it, but you got to have outlets and you got to be able to attack behind it. One of the things that I think Trey Young has added to his game since last season, and it's going to serve him well with the increased defensive attention that he's going to get is a left to right crossover, right to left crossover, you know, just to create space. Uh, he had one absolutely ridiculous highlight play tonight that you should go see if you haven't seen it already, but he absolutely lost a magnificent defender in Josh Richardson with one of those crossovers and buried a three. Uh, you know, one of the best basketball plays you're ever going to see. Uh, to you know, to one, lose one of the best on-ball defenders in the league, and then two, make the shot uh, after that. Uh, that's that's extremely impressive. Uh, but in addition, you know, one uh, one of the contexts in which Trey has used that move, the side-to-side -side crossovers, is because he's getting blitz and when he's getting blitzed. Uh, that particular move is useful in that context because he can do a side-to-side -side dribble going towards the screen, and so the defense sets up to blitz it, and then he just kind of yanks the ball back with a crossover, rejects the screen, and goes the other direction. So I asked Pierce about that move, too. What does Trey get out of rejecting the screen in those situations? Because I think we've seen that a few times. His layup at the end of the game was, you know, they blitz on one side, he rejected, and now there's two guys behind the basketball. Um, and, and he gets a layup, I think it was 97, 97. He gets a layup because our spacing was great. Uh, DeAndre Hunter was in the corner and Kevin was up top. And they're afraid to help because we got two shooters and Vince was in front of the basket. We got three shooters locked and loaded. No one wants to help. He gets a layup because he rejected the blitz. And so, you know, he, he's starting to see it too. He, He's seeing the blitz come, and he's able to reject, and now we've got shooters, and because we've got shooters, they space the floor. That help has to come from a, a great distance to try and take him away from the basket. He gets down there, so if it's a blow by, you get blown by, it's hard to scheme for that. So reject, similar to a blow by, it's hard to scheme for those guys to come over and help, and that's why he's able to get him basically an uncontested layup to give us up too. Some other notable stuff from this game. Uh, before the game, Lloyd Pierce noted that Kevin Herter, Cam Reddish, DeAndre Hunter all had their minutes restrictions bumped up. I believe that prior to this game, they were at 15 and 25, respectively. That's 15 for Herter, 25 for Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter. And for this one, it was 20 minutes for Herter and 30 for Reddish and Hunter. And again, with Hunter, I don't think that's any kind of special rehab or recovery from an injury or anything like that. 
I just believe that they, you know, were being careful with a rookie in his first NBA games. Uh, but anyways, it's now at 30, and for Herter and Hunter, they both reach those caps uh, before the end of the game. And so with a couple minutes left, there were fewer options for Pierce than he might normally have. I mean, I, for sure, uh, once Herter is feeling better, he's going to play more than 20 minutes. And so you know that he's, you know that cap definitely affects the rotations, but even, even Hunter's cap of 30 minutes was met tonight, and that's why you didn't see him uh, in the last couple of minutes. Uh, speaking of which, you know, if you look at his plus minus ratings in the first three games, uh, it's pretty ridiculous. Hunter was plus 12 in his first game, plus 21 in his second game, and plus 10 tonight in a two-point loss. Uh, the Hawks, it's, it's plainly evident that they are a better team when DeAndre Hunter is on the floor. I mean, he's a, as I tweeted tonight, he is a whole basketball player. He can shoot, he can defend. You know, more impressive is his ability to make plays. You know, the Hawks are putting him in pick and roll and he's finding guys and making the right decision. He's, he's incredible. There are situations when the Hawks run plays for him. That's not something you expect for a, a player who's in his third NBA game on a roster with other good offensive players like John Collins and Trey Young but not only is Hunter good but the Hawks are invested in his development and he is going to learn on the job I thought it was interesting tonight he was he was a target if you will for Ben Simmons Ben Simmons was very clearly trying to challenge him physically trying to initiate a lot of uh torso to torso contact to see you know what he could what kind of space he could create just by being physical and Hunter just stood him up I mean there was one play where uh, Hunter had an and one on a foul by Simmons going to the basket and you know they both players kind of fell off equally from the contact on the play you know Joel Embiid had a monster dunk uh, that ended up resulting in uh, offsetting technical fouls. But if you look at the lead up before that dunk, one of the reasons he was able to get open is that the help defense couldn't get there because Ben Simmons basically just got a running start and you know just kind of plowed Hunter from behind like it was a blindside football block. Uh, Hunter went into Reddish and effectively hit, you know, Simmons had taken out two of the Hawks players at that point. Uh, kind of a bizarre play, and I know there were a lot of things that people were upset about after that dunk. I wonder secretly if 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 that was one of the things that they were upset about because that was clearly a uh, questionable a, a play of questionable integrity by Simmons because he basically just got a running start and ran into somebody. Uh, so interesting. Anyways, I digress. The the bigger point was that he you know he was trying to challenge Hunter physically, and Hunter just does not shy away from that. In fact. You, know, you get the sense that he just quietly rises to the moments. He had a jump shot shortly right after that, a three-point shot. Uh, very clutch. He's, he's an impressive, impressive young player. Uh, and it was, it was interesting to see him rise to the occasion. And the Hawks went to him a lot just because the Sixers are an enormous team and you need big players to make plays against those kind of teams. Speaking of DeAndre Hunter... Uh, both Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter are from Philadelphia. So I asked them uh, after shoot-around this morning if they were 76ers fans growing up, and they, you know, they both kind of answered the same way, uh, the way a lot of players answer when you ask them about their favorite NBA team growing up. I, you know, with these, with these guys who are younger and younger, they, they grew up in the era of free agency, and they're basketball players themselves, so they want to... They want to copy and emulate players, and so they're kind of players' first people. And Reddish and Hunter both said that they were less fans of teams and more fans of players. And for Reddish, uh, he was big into Kevin Durant and LeBron James. And, you know, with DeAndre Hunter, his answer was a little bit more Philadelphia-based. With the 76ers in town tonight, we got to ask, uh, were you a 76ers fan growing up? Uh, no, nah, not really. Uh, my family was though; they went to some of the games, but 
I know it wasn't big Sixers fan. I was, a, I was an AI fan, but I wasn't a Sixers fan. Were you a fan of other players then? Sort of kind of. I know a lot of players say that you know their allegiances were more to players than teams growing up. Was that the case for you? Yeah, I was more players. Not really. I don't really root for teams. More of a player. Yeah. Who, who were your Who were your favorites that? I like uh, AI, like I said. Uh huh. Um, I like Iggy. Uh, I like Lou Will when he was there. That's gonna make you very popular in Atlanta. He's he's a he's a hero here. Yeah, we will. That's that's about it. My favorite AI moment was probably when he stepped over uh around Lou. I feel like I don't know, that's just like an iconic moment. Like how can you not like that moment? Interesting to hear the Iggy fandom. Uh, I think Andre Iguodala is an interesting comp for DeAndre Hunter. I know most people are probably fami more familiar with Iguodala's work because of what he did with the Warriors, but you know, if you go back to what he was in Philadelphia, whew, he was just he was an all-world defender. As good as he was with the Warriors, uh, he was he was better and more athletic with the Sixers. I mean, he he had it all as a defender when he was in Philadelphia. Uh, so that's that's it's interesting to to hear that you know he was watching Iguodala during his impressionable years. These guys are so young. That doesn't seem like long, that long ago that Iguodala was in Philadelphia, but you know, if you do the arithmetic, I'm sure that was probably when you know, Hunter was a preteen. <laughs> the fun part is that you know, while Iguodala maybe was more athletic at that point, Hunter comes into the league, I think, probably stronger than Iguodala was as a, as a rookie and you know, with much, much, much more polish on the offensive end uh, so anyways I found that I found that interesting I, I'm entertained that that he was watching Iguodala at a young age switching gears you know I had a moment the other day where I was hoping that I said somewhere either on Twitter or in print or on a podcast with Tyler or just even on a podcast by myself uh, the one that I was hoping that I said out loud somewhere was that I think the Rockets, you know, I thought they, they were going to eventually use Tabo Cephalosha as a small ball center just because the way the Rockets play under Dan Tony, you know, they want to have guys who are out there who are solid defensively and their answer every time things get tough, every time things get tough in that switching defense is to just go smaller, uh, opt for more shooting. You're switching anyway, so having a seven-foot guy in there to rebound isn't necessarily the greatest thing because he might get switched off and end up 25 feet from the hoop when the ball's coming off. So, you know, they just they just play a certain way where, you know, losing a little bit of size at the center position is not that big of a deal. And of course, you know, with Cephalosha, who's a pretty amazing defender even at an old age, uh, his his seven-foot-four wingspan or whatever it is will will come in handy and. You know, there was that report this week that D'Antoni was considering using Cephalosha at center at some point, and I was kicking myself at that point that hopefully I had that jotted down or noted somewhere. And another one that I hope I noted on the podcast at some point during the preseason was just watching Trey Young shoot. His shot looked better. Uh, it looked more repeatable. It looked like the release point might have been just a little bit lower. He just had so much balance, and it was something about the release that seemed like the rotation on the ball had kind of slowed down, but just a beautiful, beautiful shot. My goodness, you know, there's so many NBA players that are fun to watch shoot a basketball, but, you know, in the preseason watching Trey, it was like, oh, that looks good. In any case, you know, hearing Pierce talk about, you know, the season to this point, you know, one of the things that he's noted is that Trey's three-point shooting is better. Uh, it's, it's worth noting. It's worth talking about. And, you know, what are the reasons why? Well, it's his second year. He's got more experience. Uh, if you go back to his first year, especially in Summer League, I don't think he'd played a lot of basketball going into Summer League. So his shot looked awful, right? Everybody made fun of his first two shots being air balls. Well, you know, he hadn't played a lot of basketball at that point going into the draft. It wasn't worth it. If he got hurt, it could hurt his draft stock, which was already sky high. So, you know, he was rusty at that point. He's also just stronger now. You know, I came across some pictures of Trey at Summer League 
from what was it 16 months ago and my goodness it's it's kind of stunning how different he looks physically how much he's changed his body and part of that's probably just getting older but another part is that he's worked on it uh, he's a lot bigger and stronger now and you know for most shooters maybe that doesn't matter that much but for someone like Trey Young it probably does uh, especially if you're shooting from 30 feet, right? I encourage you to go out on a basketball court and stand 30 feet away from the rim and see what that shot looks like. You've got to be really strong to do it. And uh, he's clearly much stronger now than he was uh, a year and a third ago if we do fractions. In any case, uh, you know, one of the things Trey talked about this morning after shoot-around was uh, you know, that three-point shot and what might be different from last year going into this one. Uh, I definitely feel way better. Uh, I put in a lot of work this summer and focusing on my shot. And uh, just getting back to what I've, I've done my whole life and, and, uh, and being a perfectionist and being very fundamental and stuff like that. Does it help you at all, like, getting off this start? I mean, whether you sustain it, whatever stats, regardless, does it help you mentally just to get off to such a strong start? Uh, it does, obviously. If you, if you hit a couple shots and you get going, it feels good. But... Um, and if, if I don't, like I miss my first two shots this season, and I mean, I still stuck with it, still focused, and I uh, was able to hit I mean, a lot of shots in a row after that. So it's all about just remaining focused and uh, just not losing track of that. Was there anything technically that you, you tweaked on it, or is it just pretty much practice and repetition? Yeah, it's more just, I mean, getting up more repetition shots, uh, just focusing on shots that I mean, I knew I was going to get in the season, like uh, throughout our play, whether it's coming out of our plays or things like that, like just knowing the type of shots I'm going to be getting uh, really helped me. Okay, I just glanced back over the content of this podcast, and it is a lot of Trey Young talk, but rightly so. Uh, <laughs> he was named Eastern Conference Player of the Week. He is an offense to himself. The Hawks continue to be very good when he's on the floor. His defense, which we've talked about on previous episodes, so I'm not going to get into that tonight, but, you know, it looked fine again tonight. So in a nutshell, the Hawks, believe it or not, are a very good basketball team now because they've solidified the wing and some other spots on their team. They're very good when Trae Young is on the floor. Uh, what's going to be noteworthy and worth keeping an eye on is what kind of team are they when he's not on the floor. Evan Turner didn't play a bunch of minutes tonight. It's going to be interesting to see what they do. I think that's, you know, one of the most interesting things, again, over the rest of the season. We kind of, you know, there are a lot of known quantities. Uh, you know you know what John Collins looks like as a power forward. You know what he looks like as a center. The Hawks look like they're going to use him in a lot of situations on both. DeAndre Hunter, for a rookie, he's one of the most predictable rookies you're going to see. Trey Young is a phenomenon on offense. But what happens when Trey Young's not on the floor? That's That's a very interesting trend to watch. The Hawks to this point in the season, have not been good without Trey Young. So it bears some watching. And that just about does it for this episode of the Trey Young Podcast. My name's Kevin Chenard. Subscribe, rate, review. I'm sure there'll be a podcast or two in the pipeline for later this week, and we would love to have you back with us again sometime soon. Thanks for listening.